What's up folks, welcome to the part 10, of what if Deku become a healer hero. Chapter 26. The bandages come off later in the morning. Izuku stands in front of a mirror, staring at his reflection. His long curls are unkempt and greasy he hasn't been able to take a proper shower in three days. Most of the other changes are minimal, the skin under his eyes is a little darker and he looks a bit pale probably the result of not being able to eat much lately due to either being in too much pain or simply unconscious. Of course, he's not paying any attention to those changes. Instead, his eyes are locked on his throat. It's an ugly scar, to say the least. His skin has been replaced by a messy web of scar tissue, taut and almost waxy looking as it stretches across the column of his throat. The flushed, sprawling lines are slightly elevated and crisscross in an angry mess, of tissue. There's also a smaller patch on the left side of his neck where Shigaraki's thumb was. It's hideous and disgusting to look at and makes Izuku's stomach churn with nausea. The nurse that removed his bandages smiles at him encouragingly pityingly and turns away to toss them in the trash. His hand grabs her sleeve. Can I keep them? He frantically types into his phone. The nurse frowns, can you put them back on? She glances at the bandages, then at him before realization lights her eyes. Oh. Oh. There's that sad smile again. Of course. Let me just get you some fresh ones. He feels a bit better once his neck is wrapped up again. He doesn't want anyone seeing that, especially not his mother. She's always been a crier, but the waterworks have been on a whole new level these past few days. He doesn't want to give her anything else to cry about. After another smoothie lunge, he's going to be on a liquid diet for a while, until his delicate throat muscles stop aching so much, Dr. Nishida discharges him from the hospital. There's really not much else they can do for him. Recovery Girl's quirk took care of the worst of the damage, now all there's left for him to do is, slowly recover from the trauma. In the meantime, He's already been set up with a speech therapist that he's going to be meeting with twice a week for the next few months. It's going to be an agonizingly slow healing process, and it will be a long time before his voice is completely back to normal, but he tries not to let it get him down. He's tired of being upset. Today he finally gets to go home. He's going to make the best of it. After thanking Dr. Nishida profusely for everything he's done, Inko and Izuku make their way down to the lobby. It feels so good to be out of a hospital gown and in his own clothes again. Inko even brought him his favorite All Might shirt to wear. Unfortunately, he was not informed that said hero would be meeting him in the lobby. What a lovely shirt, All Might says, lip twitching as he struggles not to laugh. Inko smiles. Oh, it's his favorite one. He wears it to bed all the time. She tilts her head in confusion when she sees the deep red flush on her son's face. Izuku? Are you feeling alright, sweetie? Izuku nods hastily, head ducked in embarrassment. All Might finally lets out a little laugh and ruffles his hair gently. Inko glances between them curiously. I feel bad that I haven't had the chance to get to know you better, Tashin or Isan, she says, after all, you helped my son get into a through recommendations and you've been so helpful and kind to me these past few days. Izuku blinks, eyeing All Might. He has? Would you like to get coffee together sometime? Inko asks. All Might looks a little startled. Oh, of of course. If, you don't mind. He smiles, but Izuku notices the slight rosy flush to his cheeks. He glances between them in bewilderment. Wait. What the hell happened while he was unconscious? Ah, uh, there you all are. Recovery girl catches their attention when she approaches. The older woman looks as Yuku up and down, pleased. Are you excited to go home, Midraya Khan? Choosing to ignore the strange moment, as Yuku turns to her and nods, smiling brightly. Good. Let's get you to your car, then. Recovery girl begins leading the way to the exit. Mirth dances in her eyes. Nice shirt. By the way, Izuku stifles a sigh. He isn't quite sure why she feels the need to escort him to the car. 
He thought she would have left after she and Dr. Nishita gave him one final examination this morning. Perhaps she had some leftover paperwork to do. Or maybe it has something to do with his new protection. Will it be like it was during his internship week? Will he have a hero driving him everywhere? That would be kind of weird, although it might explain why All Might is still here too. He's so busy lost in his thoughts that he hardly even looks up when Recovery Girl opens the door and steps aside, allowing him to exit the hospital first. Surprise! Izuku nearly leaps out of his skin, a soundless eep, escaping his lips. All of his classmates and then some stand outside the hospital, grinning at him brightly as they cheer happily. The next thing he knows, he's being yanked into the crowd, everyone swarming around him patting his back and ruffling his hair. He's so utterly startled and confused. But he doesn't have time to think before he's being pulled into his first of many tight hugs. Dude. I'm so glad you're alright. Kirishima tearfully exclaims, crushing Izuku against his chest. Holy shit, I'm never letting you out of my sight again. Me neither. Ashido pipes up as she hugs Izuku from behind. She rubs her cheek against his back. I was so scared. Me too, man, fuck Shigaraki, Kaminari declares so vehemently that Izuku snorts. The electric blonde grins and starts pushing Kirishima away, whining, hey, come on, it's my turn to hug him. What about me? I wanna hug him too. Your Araka pops up out of nowhere. I'm not done yet. Kirishima growls playfully, tightening his hold on Izuku. Your Araka pouts. Can I get a hug too? Hey, I want one. Don't hug him to yourselves, pass him around. Midraya kun It's so good to see you. I've missed you, man. I'm so glad you're okay. Overwhelmed, Izuku lets himself be passed from classmate to classmate, each one hugging him tightly and expressing their immense relief. He's never been so simultaneously surprised, confused, and happy before in his life. How are they all here? Don't they have school? A hand suddenly, grabs his arm, pulling him out of a hug from Yerazu and Jiru. Oi, oi, quit glomping him, you fucking leeches. He can recognize that rough growl anywhere. Face splitting into a blinding grin, Izuku turns around and proceeds to glomp Kaken. His friend grunts under his weight, but hugs back no less tightly. Sorry about the ambush. Kaken grumbles in his ear, it was just gonna be me and my, old hag, but I made the mistake of telling shitty hair about it. Guy can't keep his fucking mouth shut to save his life. Hey! Kirishima shouts somewhere behind him. You're lucky it's only these guys, Kaken huffs, it took ages to convince those class B fuckers not to come too. Izuku desperately wants to say something, to tell him not to worry about it because this is perfect. This is so, much better than anything he could have imagined. Dumb happy tears are pricking his eyes and making his vision blurry. Somehow, it gets even better. Hey, hey, hey. Senpai's coming through. Mirio's cheerful voice calls out, move it, kiddies. I'd phase through you. But I don't think Madriya Kun would appreciate seeing me naked right now. Oh god, please no, Tamaki groans lowly. Izuku looks up, to see the two boys plus Neji are pushing their way through the crowd. Well, more like Muriel pushes while Tamaki and Neji are take advantage of the path he's made with his large body. When they reach him, Neji unabashedly pushes Kaken away he screeches like a rabid cat, and squeezes Izuku tightly. My baby. She coos, rubbing her cheek against his. Her hair tickles his nose and makes him sneeze. A big hand ruffles his curls. How are you doing, my little Koo Hai? Mirio beams. I've missed you. He's only been gone for three days. Hey, you. Najire grabs his face, making him pay attention to her again. Never scare me like that again. I nearly peed my pants when we heard what happened. Tamaki Kun actually did. A few people around them snort while Tamaki looks like he wants the earth to swallow him whole. Plus, Nejire adds, 
I just wanted to let you know that I will be personally chasing down Chigraki and cutting off his testicles and feeding them to him for daring to lay a hand on my precious Kuhai. She smiles innocently and squeezes him in a hug again. A few of the boys shift uncomfortably. I like her. Izuku hears your Arakase behind him. Mirio whines at Nejir until she, finally lets him hug Izuku. Squashed against his muscly chest, Izuku glances at Tamaki helplessly. The older boy just smiles softly, a wordless expression of his own relief and happiness. Kirishima clasps Izuku's shoulder once he's sat down. Alright, has everyone had a chance to hug Madriyakun? He calls out. I haven't, Totoraki says, pushing his way past Hida. To Izuku's immense surprise, Shinsu appears too. Yeah, me neither. How many people are here? Hugging Totoraki and Shinsu is a new experience for him, and neither of them seem very, ah, adept at it. It kind of just feels like hugging two tall, awkward trees. Warm trees, though. Warm and friendly trees that he's missed very much. How are you doing, Midraya? Totoraki asks. Kirishima puts an arm around his shoulders. Yeah, come on, Midraya-kun, you've barely made a peep. Tell us how you've been, man, Saro says, I feel like you've been gone for ages. Yeah, Ashido agrees, clinging to Izuku's arm, three days is way too long to go without talking to our healer. Something in Izuku's chest cracks. His throat suddenly feels very tight, but it doesn't have anything to do with the scar tissue. He slowly, glances up at his senpais. Then at all his friends. They're all gazing at him affectionately, waiting for him to say something. He swallows thickly. It's his fault they've been so stressed and worried these past few days. The least he could do is tell the truth. Taking a deep breath, he opens his mouth and speaks. I. I guess I have been better. Everyone freezes. Then, their expressions slowly darken. The way their faces, all crumple simultaneously would be almost comical if it wasn't so fucking tragic. He can't blame them for their reactions, though. His voice. Can he even call it a voice anymore? It's really nothing more than a weak, raspy wheeze. He can't feel his vocal cords vibrating in his mangled throat. All he can do is move his mouth and do the best he can to make sound by pushing the air out of his lungs, it's weaker than a whisper, practically inaudible, and it's the most pathetic sound he's ever heard. Silence fills the air. Izuku ducks his head, tears stinging his eyes as he refuses to look at his friends. Kirishima is the first one to speak up, his voice soft and confused. I. I thought. He slowly turns his white worried eyes to Kakin. Recovery girl. Didn't she? Kakin doesn't respond. Jaw clenched as he gazes at Izuku with a pained expression. Izuku shrinks in on himself, feeling the weight of everyone's stares. Is it? Ashido whispers, eyes watering, is it gone forever? Izuku shakes his head just as recovery girl speaks up. No, it's not. The crowd parts as she makes her way over to her apprentice's side. She pats his hand reassuringly before looking at his friends. There's some scarring on his vocal cords, but they'll get stronger with time and therapy. His voice is just going to be a bit weak for a while. Relief washes through the students, but there's still an uneasy silence in the air. Izuku hesitantly raises his head. Totoraki is standing in front of him, expression closed off. Izuku knows him well enough by now to know that he's keeping his face, carefully blank to hide what must be a turmoil of emotions inside. Beside him, Shinsu looks sad but also strangely. Resigned. His purple eyes obviously linger on Izuku's bandaged throat. Kakin looks the same way he did a couple nights ago when he cried over him. He's blaming himself. They all are. Whatever their expressions are. Izuku can see the bitter guilt behind their eyes as clear as day, it makes him want to cry, but his wheezy, breathless sobs sound much worse than his voice does. So instead, he forces back his tears and looks up at Mirio. He's never seen his senpai look so crestfallen before. But as soon as he realizes that Izuku is looking at him, 
Mirio plasters on a smile and straightens up. Well, then, that's great news. Knowing Madraya Kund, he'll probably be singing like a songbird in no time. Mirio's cheerful laugh is as forced as his smile, but it does the trick. Yeah, no one's more determined than Madraya Kun. Kirishima perks up. Ida chops a hand. Patience and persistence is the key to success. Don't worry, Madraya Kun, Yerazu says, take as much time as you need to get better. Honestly, you're so smart. You probably know some secret body hack to get yourself better even faster. Came in Ari jokes. A few people let out forced laughs, patting Izuku's back and reassuring him. He flushes and mouths, Thank you. The only ones who don't say anything are Kaken, Totoraki, Shinsu, and Tamaki. His raven haired senpai is watching him with an odd expression, as if analyzing to see if he's really okay. Izuku's lip twitches and he gives a subtle nod. He isn't sure if he'll want to talk about the panic attack he had last night or even if that'll be the only one, but at least he knows that if he ever needs help with stuff like that, then he can go to Tamaki. And maybe Aizawa too. He was pretty good at calming him down after his panic attack. Taking out his phone, he types, I'm really glad you guys are here. This is the best surprise ever, I really missed you. Ashido reads out loud for him, then alls and hugs him again. We missed you too. School isn't the same without you. Your Araku says. You're not coming back this week, right? Ida asks, you really should take some time to rest. Oh, he will, recovery girl says resolutely, giving Izuku a pointed look. Izuku glances away innocently. Actually, he should get started on, that as soon as possible, so. Aizawa takes the hint. Alright brats, you've been holding the Madrias up long enough. Time to let them get home. Kirishima's hand shoots up into the air. Actually. If you don't mind, Midraya-san. Inko startles as Kirishima looks at her earnestly. I'd like to escort you guys home. Midraya kun's my buddy, you know? I wanna make sure he gets home safe. I'm already going with him, idiot, Kaken grunts. Wait, that's not fair. Ashido complains, I wanna come too. How the fuck is it not fair? Kakin scowls. We live in the same damn neighborhood, it makes sense for us to go together. Totoraki steps up beside Izuku. I'd like to see him home too, if you don't mind, Midraya san. Kakin whirls around. Oi, fuck off, icy hot. I'd like to go as, well, Tokoyami says, none of us could keep Midraya kun safe at the mall, the least we could do is provide protection for him now. His words seem to strike a bitter chord in his classmates, all of whom start chiming in with their own requests to escort his Yuku home. Inko glances between them all with wide, adoring eyes, her heart swelling up with affection for the young heroes that wish to protect her son so fiercely, while his Yuku ducks his head to hide his burning face. Oh you, that's cute, Mirio says over the arguing voices of the first years. But let's not forget who are the ones who actually have their provisional hero licenses. He grins and arches a brow teasingly while numerous heads whip towards him and glare. Arms wrap around his Yuku's chest and a chin plops on his head. Oh. Yes. So why don't you leave this to your senpais? Don't worry, we'll take good care of Madraya Kun. She presses a quick kiss onto his curls, which makes him blush even harder. Meanwhile. 19 hero course students burn holes into the girl with their fiery eyes. Najire smiles shamelessly. Actually, none of that will be necessary, Aizawa draws in a bore tone, there's already a detailed, security plan in action for Madraya Kun. He doesn't need your constant protection. Can we still go, though? Kirishima asks Senko, just to hang out, at least. Ida makes another chopping motion, scolding. It's rude to invite yourself over to someone's house. Oh uh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to know, no, it's alright. Inko insists, smiling at the class, I really, really, appreciate it. Actually, it's so nice to know that my baby has such protective friends. 
The student spin while is Yuku internally groans. Baby? Really? It's alright if a few of you come over, Inko says, I'm sure Izuku would appreciate the company after being so bored in the hospital. Izuku nods eagerly. There's a bit of an argument as to who gets to go. Turns out, Aizawa did decide to use their afternoon, hero lesson time to bring everyone to the hospital since it's their last class of the day and doesn't that make Izuku's heart blossom with warmth but, of course, some people aren't able to go to his house since they have something else to do later, so they bid Izuku goodbye, each one giving him one last hug before leaving. The remaining students bicker for a few more minutes until Aizawa gets, fed up and decides for them. Yureraka, Yerazu, Sero, and Shinsu are unfortunately banished from today's play date. That leaves Kaken, Kirishima, Kaminari, and Ashido who will all go in Auntie Mitsuki's car, while Totoraki, Ida, Izuku, and Inko will squeeze into a car driven by Aizawa. Apparently, Izuku's new protection arrangement is pretty similar to his internship experience in that a pro, Hiro will need to accompany him if he needs to be driven anywhere. He stifles a sigh. As the Because Quad Minus Sero goes over to Auntie Mitsuki's car, Izuku glances over his shoulder at his senpais. I'll be there in a minute, he types, waiting for Totoraki and Ida to read it before jogging over to where Mirio, Tamaki, and Nejire are standing a few feet away. He isn't quite sure how they got out, of class, but he won't question it. Mirio smiles as he approaches and pulls him into a hug. It's longer than their last one, now that there's not a crowd of restless teenagers to disturb them. Izuku sighs contentedly snuggling against Mirio's chest. Despite being very muscular, the taller boy is surprisingly very comfortable to cuddle. When they pull away, Mirio's smile turns just a little bit, sadder, eyes softening as he gazes down at him. His hand moves to his Yuku's shoulder, carefully lingering near his bandaged neck. After a moment, he says quietly, I'm sorry about your voice, Midraya-kun. This should never have happened to someone like you. Izuku stares up at him, then lowers his eyes. His smile fades away. For some reason that escapes him, he doesn't really feel like he has to keep up the facade around his senpais. With his classmates, he feels a certain pressure to act like he's okay, to try and make them not worry about him anymore in order to lessen the guilt that claws at his heart and theirs. But it's different with his senpais. Tamaki has already seen him at his worst. And they all worked together, took time out of their day, just to make him feel better. It just, feels, safer with them. Not that he doesn't feel safe around his classmates. But it's different. He doesn't really know how or why, but it just is. If, if you ever need anyone to talk to. Tamaki trails off. Nejire wrinkles her nose and nudges him. Weren't you paying attention, you dumb dumb? He can't talk. Tamaki's eyes widen in horror. Oh, no I I'm so sorry, I didn't mean he flails his arms, as he sputters, but his Yuku, catches his wrist, making him shut up. The greenette smiles exasperatedly as if to say dude, chill, I get it, you're fine. Tamaki flushes and nods, dropping his gaze. Er, well, um, yeah, he coughs. And I meant what I said about Shigaraki. Nejire looks at him seriously, eyes flashing as she vows, I'll neuter him like a fucking puppy. Nejire kun. Mirio gasps, slapping his hands over, Izuku's ears. Izuku rolls his eyes and pushes them off. Mirio grins and squeezes his hands once before nudging him away. Go on, then, Aizawa sensei is getting impatient. Smiling, Izuku turns and starts trotting back to the car where Aizawa, Inko, Totoraki, and Ida wait for him. Have a fun day with your friends, sweetie. Najire obnoxiously calls out behind him. And remember to text us when you, get home. Mirio adds before the two start giggling like idiots. Izuku groans very loudly in his head. Ida gazes at the upperclassmen quizzically as he approaches. Remind me, Midraya kun how exactly did you become friends with those third years? I feel like they just started popping up out of nowhere. 
Totoraki shrugs. He meets a lot of people as a healer, I guess. And I think one of them was, helping him out with his quirk? He glances at Izuku, who nods in confirmation. Ah, Ida hums. Well, if you're finally ready, then let's get going. Aizawa slides into the driver's seat. Inko gets into the front seat next to him, leaving Ida, Totoraki, and Izuku to squeeze together in the back. While Totoraki opens the door for him, Izuku glances over his shoulder. He didn't really get to say, goodbye to Recovery Girl or All Might. His mentor is still standing in front of the hospital, idly chatting with one of the nurses. All Might, however, has moved to stand beside Mirio who is noticeably sans Tamaki and Nejire. The hero has a hand on his future successor's shoulder as he mutters to him lowly. As if sensing Izuku's gaze, All Might glances up and sends him a sincere smile when their eyes meet. Midraya? Totoraki questions. Izuku startles and climbs into the car, taking the middle seat so Totoraki can slide him after him. The ride back home takes about 20 minutes. Ida does most of the talking, although Izuku notices that Totoraki is making a bit more of an effort than usual to converse, probably to take some of the pressure off of Ida. Since he's sitting in between the two boys, it's easy for them to see what he types on his phone. Having a conversation that's half talking, half typing is definitely strange, but he supposes he'll have to get used to it for now. Aizawa doesn't stay for very long once they get home departing with a polite nod to Inko and a pat on the head to Izuku. As soon as the boy steps inside his house, he's immediately knocked backwards by, Sushi, who cannonballs into his chest. Thankfully, Totoraki catches him before he hits the ground. Is that a cat? Totoraki asks, bewildered, as he pushes Izuku back to his feet. No way, it's too big to be a cat, Kirishima says. Sushi starts purring loudly as he aggressively nuzzles Izuku, who sneezes when he gets fur in his nose. Holy shit, it is a cat! Kaminari exclaims. Kakin huffs, that's debatable. He shoulders past Totoraki to walk inside, Sushi giving him a customary hiss as he passes by. Kakin snarls back and dodges the paw that swipes at him. Izuku smiles and nuzzles Sushi. He really missed this cat. Ida frowns. It doesn't seem very fond of you, but Kagukun. Fucking little shit hates everyone that's not Zuku. Kakin snaps back, already making his way to the couch. The rest of Izuku's friends turn to look at the cat in his arms. Surprisingly, Totoraki is the first one to be brave enough to reach out. Sushi sniffs the offered hand gingerly for a few moments, then turns away in disinterest. Totoraki blinks. Well, Ashido says, it didn't hiss at you. She reaches out to pet Sushi, only to yelp and retract her hand when the cat angrily swipes at it. Hey! Kaminari and Kirishima burst into obnoxious laughter and she rolls her eyes. Oh, shut up. Izuku gives her an apologetic look and shoes Sushi back into the house. As they walk in. However, he definitely does not miss the small, pleased smile on Totoraki's face. The remnants of the Because Quad immediately make themselves at home in the living room, getting comfy on the couch while Ida and Totoraki are a bit more mannerly. It's a little crowded with so many of his friends in the house, but Enko decides to make an occasion out of it and invites Andy Mitsuki and Uncle Masaru over, although the adults mostly just stick to the kitchen. While he's eager to hang out with his friends, Izuku is also looking forward to taking a proper shower for the first time in three days. He manages to, convince Kakin to keep the others entertained while he's busy. The shower helps a lot. It kind of feels like he's washing away the remains of the incident. The hot water feels. Strange against his scarred neck. Not painful, but definitely different. Of course, he has to take his bandages off in order to shower. So when he steps out he once again catches sight of his scar in the mirror. For a few, moments, he simply stares at his reflection. He doesn't think he'll ever get used to seeing his throat like this. It doesn't matter how many showers he takes or how hard he scrubs, nothing will ever get rid of this constant reminder. 
He makes sure his scar is completely hidden by the bandages before he walks out of the bathroom. Unsurprisingly, Kakan has decided that the best way to entertain their friends is to dominate them in video games. He, Kirishima, and Kaminari are in an intense game of Mario Kart when Izuku rejoins them. Seeing his still damp curls, Ashido immediately perks up and demands to let her play with his hair. So, he ends up seated with her on the couch, watching Kakan become increasingly more and more competitive while Ashido brushes out his curls with a wet comb. Totoraki and Iida sit on opposite ends of the couch, both looking a mix between confused and judgmental as their friends continue to play. I don't understand, Ida says, is this based off of a movie or book series of some sort? Who are these characters? Oh, come on, Ida kun Ashido rolls her eyes as she brushes out a particularly stubborn knot. Don't act like you've never heard of Mario, before. Well, I have, of course, I just. Ida looks away, cheeks tinged pink. I've never played it before. Izuku isn't surprised. Ida doesn't seem like the gaming type. Neither does Totoraki, although his lack of experience might be more due to his restrained upbringing rather than a lack of interest. Kirishima, being the wonderful friend he is, offers to teach Ida how to play. He forces Kakan to sit out this round since the blonde will absolutely not go easy on either of them even if it's a training round. Kakan huffily plops himself down in the small spot between Totoraki and Izuku on the couch, unashamedly making them both have to wiggle away from him to make space. The fuck are you doing to his hair, raccoon eyes? Kakan barks. Ashido, who has long since patted Izuku's curls dry, replies simply, I'm braiding it. Duh. She runs her fingers along a curl and sighs longingly. Your hair is so pretty, Midori-kun. Mine gets so weird when I grow it out. You should wear it down more often. Totoraki has been quietly watching Ashido as she expertly pulls Izuku's hair into an increasingly more and more intricate hairstyle. After a pause, he says, I like it. Izuku, glances at him in surprise. Totoraki looks away and coughs, when it's down, I mean. You don't like my braids? Ashido pouts. I like that too. Totoraki adds awkwardly. Rolling his eyes, Kakan grumbles something under his breath that Izuku doesn't quite catch. Totoraki, however, does, and proceeds to give Kakan a not-so-subtle dirty look. Takes one to no one, he retorts. Kakan's eyes, widen comically before he turns and pounces on Totoraki with a screech. I'll kill you, fucker. Izuku jumps to his feet the same time Kirishima does. Whoa. Whoa. What's going on, guys? The redhead dives forward, trying to separate the two scuffling boys. Kaminari and Dida get up to help too. Meanwhile, Ashido remains perched on the couch, watching the scene with an unimpressed gaze. A, hey, come, on, Midori-kun, she says, unconcerned, trying to tug Izuku back to the couch, leave those idiots to it. Totoraki and Kakan tumble off the couch with a loud thump, the latter pinning the former to the ground. Kirishima manages to wrap his arms around Kakan's shoulders and haul him off of Totoraki, Kaminari bravely fending off his flailing legs. Meanwhile, Izuku and Ida help a significantly, more rumpled looking Totoraki to his feet. What did you say to him? Ida asks. Totoraki doesn't reply and instead shrugs them off. Straightening up, he looks across the room where Kirishima and Kaminari are still struggling to wrangle a furious Kakan. Bukagu, Totoraki says, voice flat. Kakan stops thrashing and fixes him with a heated glare. Totoraki doesn't even bat an eye. Let's play, Kakan's eyes narrow. You're on, fuckface. Huh? Kirishima blinks in surprise as the two boys move towards the TV. Wait. But I was in the middle of teaching Ida Kun how to play. Kakan and Totoraki ignore him, each picking up a remote and sitting down on the ground. Kaminari swallows. Uh, is this a good idea? Ida tilts his head. I suppose it's better than them fighting. A hand, wraps around Izuku's elbow, pulling him back down to the couch. Ashido goes back to working on his hair, 
sighing exasperatedly, boys. Thoroughly confused, Izuku watches as Kaken picks Bowser as usual in Totoraki picks. Toad? He isn't sure if Totoraki picked him because he's actually familiar with the character or if it's because of the slight resemblance. He almost wants to laugh, but the tension in the air prevents him from doing so. This clearly isn't just a game. Whatever is going on between Kaken and Totoraki, this match seems to be just an outlet they can take their feelings out on. Which, yeah, it's better than physically fighting each other, but it makes Izuku a little nervous. And sad. He thought they'd be okay with each other after the final exams. He thought they'd had their life-changing, bonding moment and were ready to be friends. Granted, it hasn't even been a week since the exams, but still. The competition between Totoraki and Kaken is fierce, the former being surprisingly good at this game. Whether it be from skill or pure stubborn spirit, the world may never know. His face remains impassive the whole time, but his Yuku can see the intense concentration in the crease in his brow and the press of his lips. Kaken, meanwhile, screeches and snarls at every attack the other boy sends his way. He nearly pounces on Totoraki again when the latter hits him with a blue shell, but Kirishima stops him. Izuku almost doesn't want to see how this will end. If Kaken wins, he'll no doubt become insufferable from his already inflated ego. However, if Totoraki wins, then that'll only rub salt in the wound of Kaken's raging insecurities, especially when it comes to the heterochromatic boy. I lost to him. I keep losing to him. He's. He's stronger than me. He'd be a better hero for you. He'd keep you safe. Yeah, Izuku doesn't really want to deal with it right now. Thankfully, Izuku's savior comes in the form of his cat. As Totoraki and Kaken start closing in on the finish line, Sushi appears out of nowhere and barrels into Kaken, hissing and spitting. The blonde shrieks, controller knocked out of his hands as the cat collides with him the force of it making his back slam into Totoraki. With both boys down, Sushi disappears as quickly as he came. Kirishima, Kaminari, and Ashido burst out into laughter. What the fuck? Kaken roars, jumping to his feet, Bowser and Toad both fall off the rainbow road. His eye witches. Fuck. I'm gonna kill that shit stain furball. Bakugukun. Ida sounds appalled. It's a cat. Is Yuku, who is also laughing, albeit in his own weird, silent way, quickly takes out his phone and starts typing. Ashido waves her hand to get everyone's attention. Ooh, ooh, Midori Kun's typing something. What? Kaken snaps, Ashido reads over as Yuku's shoulder and snickers, he says, it's your own fault for sitting within Sushi's attack range. You should know better than to sit on the floor by now, Kaken. She grins wickedly. Oh my god, please tell me this cat's been tormenting him for years. Izuku nods and she dissolves into peals of laughter. Fuck you, raccoon eyes. Kaken whirls around to glare at Totoraki, who is still sitting cross-legged on the floor. We're doing a fucking rematch. Totoraki tilts his head in consideration, then shrugs. Nah. It was kind of boring. Besides, he stands up and brushes past Kaken. I was winning anyway. Izuku nearly face palms. Kirishima and Kaminari just barely managed to stop Kaken from murdering Totoraki right then and there on the spot. Izuku stares at Totoraki incredulously as the taller boy impassively makes his way over to the couch and sits down beside him. After a moment, Totoraki realizes he's being stared at and glances over. What? Sighing, Izuku types, must you provoke him? Totoraki blinks. It's friendly banter. Izuku glances at Kaken, who is still struggling against Kirishima and Kaminari as he shouts profanities at Totoraki. He, glances back at Totoraki, who looks thoroughly unbothered by all of this. Then he glances behind him at Ashido, who has already finished with his hair but is still sitting behind him for some reason. Rolling his eyes. He whispers to her exasperatedly, boys. She smirks. Finally, someone who understands. Thankfully, 
The next couple of hours go by with a significant less amount of violence. Now, that Ashido has relinquished her grasp on Izuku, he's able to play a few rounds himself, helping Kirishima finish teaching Ida how to play. Ida, obviously, isn't very good since he's a beginner, so the competition really ends up being between Izuku and Kirishima. Izuku makes sure to use enough dirty moves to piss Kirishima off enough to erase any thoughts of letting him win out of pity and, proceeds to beat the redhead with his superior skill. Kirishima wails in defeat while Izuku shamelessly gloats. They start spicing things up with 1v1s and he goes a few rounds, beating Ida three more times, Kaminari twice, Kakin once, then losing to Kakin twice. Kirishima and Ashido each once before he starts to get a bit tired. He knows it's only natural to have less energy after healing, from such a traumatic injury, so he tries not to be too bitter about it as he passes his remote off to Ashido. Ida and Totoraki have long since stopped playing, deciding that gaming isn't exactly their scene, and are simply watching their friends play as they sit together on the couch. Izuku goes over and immediately makes himself comfortable as he curls up between his too much calmer friends, his socked feet end up pressed against Ida's thigh and his cheek is squished against Totoraki's shoulder. He's well aware that neither of the boys are well versed in the art of cuddling, but he can only bite back an amused smirk when they both nod so subtly stiffen up beside him. The trio silently watches Ashido and Kaminari bicker over which course to pick for the round. Kakin is sitting, nearby, looking pissed off as usual, but for once he's not the one arguing. Izuku is immensely grateful for the frankly impressive level of control Kirishima has over his childhood friend. Beside him, Totoraki shifts. For a moment, Izuku thinks he's trying to get away and presses closer, the warmth from his left side feeling heavenly. He can't see the boy's face, but he can see his jaw turning, towards him. Midraya, Totoraki says quietly. His voice has a strangely serious tone to it, devoid of any of the light energy in the atmosphere. Izuka forgets himself for a moment and tries to hum in response, then remembers and nods instead. Totoraki hesitates. I... I didn't get to say this earlier, but... I'm sorry... for not being there. Izuku blinks and pulls back to look at his face. Totoraki glances away for a brief moment, then forces himself to meet his gaze. I just can't help thinking. If I had gone with you guys, if I had been there, then maybe you wouldn't have gotten hurt. Izuku is already shaking his head rapidly. Don't, he whispers, barely audible, please. Stop. Do don't feel gooey. Guilty. We all are. Izuku glances behind him to see Ida looking somber. He didn't realize he'd heard. The blue-haired boy gazes down at the couch with a tight expression, fist clenched. We're supposed to be heroes, he bites out, and we couldn't even protect our own healer. You've always worked hard to keep us safe and we couldn't do the same for you. Yet he cuts himself off, looking up at his yuku briefly before averting his gaze, lips pressed. It's not something that can be, so easily brushed off. The rest of their friends have stopped bickering by now. The video game music plays on in the background, but nobody pays attention. Instead, they're all wearing their own dark, grim expressions, the overwhelming guilt that's so poorly hidden in their eyes making Izuku's heart clench painfully. No, no, come on, they were just having fun. What happened? He almost resents, Totoraki for bringing this up. E, he wheezes. D don't damn it. Kirishima hisses, startling him. Kiri. How can you not see how much of a failure this was for us? The redhead glares at him with frustrated, shiny eyes. He lets out a bark of humorless laughter, you should be mad at us, honestly. We spend all this time doing all this training and yet a villain was still able to snatch, you right from under our noses. It's our fault you got so hurt. Izuku stares at him feeling like he's going to be sick. His usually cheerful friend is wiping angry tears from his eyes, shoulders hunched in defeat. Beside him, Kakin is glowering at the ground, jaw clenched and muscles as tight as a bowstring. That fucker got you while you were with me. 
Izuku realizes now that Kirishima is, probably feeling as horrible and guilty as Kakan is. He was the only other one that was as close as the blonde was when Izuku was taken. Izuku doesn't know what to do. Part of him wants to apologize, but that might just make it worse. He knows how annoyed he is with people apologizing to him, so he imagines his friends wouldn't appreciate it if he apologized to them, especially if they feel, they're the ones at fault. He opens his mouth to speak, then closes it. Instead, he types, I'm not mad. I don't blame anyone but Shigaraki. Totoraki reads for him, voice blank and hollow. A tense silence follows, only broken by the murmuring voices of the adults in the kitchen. Then, Ashido uncrosses her legs and stands up, making her way over to the couch and squeezing between him and Ida. I, just wanna let you know, she says as she wraps her arms around him, that we're gonna be super annoying and overprotective from now on. Oh, definitely. Kaminari immediately says, smiling a bit, but it doesn't really reach his eyes. For once, Kakan agrees with them. Yeah, so don't fucking complain about it, dumbass, he snaps. We're never going to let you get hurt again, Totoraki promises, Ida and Kirishima nod. Izuku has half a mind to remind them that he's already going to be having a bunch of pro heroes looking out for him 24-7 from here on out, but. He supposes it wouldn't be too bad to indulge them. Normally, he's annoyed by overprotectiveness. He's had Kakan hanging over his shoulder practically his entire life. But now he realizes that it's for him as much as it is for, his friends. They need this too. This incident has dealt a serious blow to their self-confidence. They need a second chance to prove to themselves that they can be good heroes. He can give that to them. So, he simply smiles and hugs Ashido back. In the meantime, he needs to get stronger. It's his fault that they worry about him, really. He's too weak, he doesn't have a combative quirk, so he needs to make up for that with double the training. It, makes sense. There's no point in telling his friends to stop worrying about him, though. He needs to show them that he can be strong too, show them that they don't have to worry about him. He wants them to be able to trust his strength so they don't worry about him so much. Surrounded by his friends as they cuddle with him on the couch, Izuku silently vows to never make them feel guilty ever, again. A portal opens in front of him, a dark, swirling mass of purple and black tendrils. From within the mass appears a pale hand, slowly stretching out and reaching towards him. He tries to move, but he can't. His feet are frozen to the ground. Long, nimble fingers curl around his throat, holding it in a painful vice grip. A high-pitched laugh bubbles from the darkness. Didn't I tell you? Little cheat code? Panic spikes through him as the hand drags him closer to the portal by the throat. He tries to thrash but his body is paralyzed, he can't move. The black tendrils are brushing against him now, the portal so close to taking him away from his life. As the hand tightens around his neck, two glowing, blood-red eyes appear in the darkness. My sensei always gets what he wants, pain explodes in his throat. Dot 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 Yuku? Zuku. Zuku. Izuku wakes up with a jolt. Crimson eyes stare down at him. He screams soundlessly and scrambles away, kicking and punching. Somebody above him grunts in pain and he twists around, trying to escape, but there's something trapping his legs. He thrashes and tugs and pulls frantically, ignoring the shouts of stop. And calm down. Because he needs, to get away, get away, get away he falls off the bed. The pain of hitting the ground stuns him long enough for Kakin to pin him down. Zuku. He barks calm down. It was just a nightmare. Izuku gasps for air, struggling to focus his scrambled mind. The red eyes are still here, but no, they're not Shigaraki's. These eyes they're his best friend's eyes, they're Kakan's. He's known them, practically his entire life. The fact that he thought even for a second that they were Shigaraki's eyes he lets out a choked, soundless sob. His third panic attack is different from the previous ones. Less panic, somehow, and more. Sad. Sad because honestly? All of this just really fucking sucks. 
Not that he's just realizing this now, but it's just hitting differently in the dark of the night, because he just woke up terrified thinking that his best friend in the whole world was the horrible villain that hurt him, and that fucking sucks. Kakin holds him through it, not making a single comment about the noiseless wheezes and breathy cries that are the only sounds his throat can make. In the back of his mind, the part that's not desperately clinging to Kakin as an anchor to the real world is Yuku feels guilty. Kakin has school tomorrow or today, depending on the time. He should be resting, not staying up coddling his Yuku. It was hard enough convincing Andy Mitsuki to let him sleep over. The only reason she let him stay was probably because as Yuku looked so pitiful a sharp pinch to his rear startles him out of his thoughts. I can hear you thinking, dumbass, Kakin grumbles, tiredly, shut up. As Yuku sniffles and clings to him when the blonde picks him up off the ground, carrying him back to bed. He doesn't question when Kakin joins him under the sheets, instead just being grateful as his friend tucks his head under his chin and holds him close. A silent offer of protection. As Yuku falls asleep breathing in Kakin's burnt sugar scent. Chapter 27 There's a week and a half before the summer boot camp. Three more days left of school one full week of break, and then they leave. Izuku has a plan a difficult one, no doubt, with how closely he's being watched by both the heroes and his friends and family. But he has to succeed. He only goes to see a speech therapist twice a week, usually in the mornings, but he's constantly practicing the exercises he's given, even when his muscles protest, when his throat feels like it's being scraped raw, he keeps on pushing forwards. He wants to get better as fast as possible. Of course, he knows the damage that can be done from rushing it, from moving too quickly and overdoing it. But he's a healer in training, he knows where the line is and how not to cross it. Sure, he might be cutting it a bit close, but it's, all in the name of getting stronger faster. Plus ultra. On top of this, he also throws himself back into training going through his drills in the backyard when his mother isn't looking. It's not ideal, practicing without a partner. And it feels like he's being constantly watched which he probably is, by whatever hero is assigned to watch over him that hour. He tries texting Shinsu, inviting him, to come over and spar, but unsurprisingly the other boy refuses, telling him to take it easy and relax. It only makes his Yuku more restless. It doesn't help that he has to train during the worst hours of the summer heat the first few days because Kakin comes straight over to his place after school, and there's no way he can keep training with the blonde around. He'd probably throw a hissy fit if he found out that Izuka was doing any sort of physical activity. Then, once the school week is over and break starts, Kakin starts spending nearly all his time at Izuku's place. It's incredibly annoying. Izuku almost feels like a prisoner in his own home. He can't go anywhere or do anything except drink smoothies and study for his provisional license exam which recovery girl is barely even, helping him with because she wants him to focus on his recovery. He's just spending all day on the computer, trying to find new things to learn until Kakin drags him away from it. And it's not that he's trying to be ungrateful or anything. He understands the need for all this, of course. Shigaraki haunts his dreams every single night, and the thought of all for one still being out there, still, being after him, terrifies him. And his mother and Kakin do their best to entertain him, and his friends, and even All Might, come over occasionally and text him every day and that's fine, everything's fine. But damn. He just can't help feeling like a bird in a cage. It'd be easier if everyone wasn't treating him as if he was made of glass. So, needless to say, he's very much looking forward to, the summer boot camp. Currently it's Friday, the day before they're meant to leave, and he's just gotten a notification from a new group message from Kirishima and Kamenari. Kamenari 10.37 AM AO, Midraya kun Midraya 10.37 AM what's up? Kamenari 10.37 AM my dude. My guy, we've got the best surprise for you. Midraya 10.38 AM? Kirishima 10.38 AM We've been feeling real bad that you've been, cooped up in our house all week, 
So we asked Aizawa sensei if we could use the pool to swim this afternoon. He said yes. Came in RA 10:39 a.m. Grab her swim trunks, dude. We're on our way over. Midrai at 10:39 a.m. But I thought I can't leave my house unless I am going to school. Kirishima 10:39 a.m. You are going to school, man. Came in RA 10:40 a.m. And we are going to escort you. Kirishima. 10.40 a.m. Aizawa sensei already alerted the pros patrolling her area that are gonna be on the move soon. Of course. Makes sense. Still, Izuku's heart swells with fondness. Midrai at 10.40 a.m. Thank you guys so much. After quickly informing his mother who for a brief moment looks like she wants to protest before a flash of guilt as her caving he darts into his room and grabs a pair of swim trunks, unsurprisingly. Kaken finds out somehow, although Inko swears she didn't tell him, and comes over. He glares when Sushi hisses at him and makes sure Izuku has everything he needs. Towel? Yup. Sunscreen? Yup. Flip-flops? Yup. Sunglasses? What are you, my mom? Kaken glares at him while Izuku rolls his eyes teasingly. Still, the blonde's glare isn't nearly as heated as usual. He's missed their playful banter as much as Izuku has. Thanks to Izuku's persistent speech therapy exercises, he's made an astounding amount of progress during the past two weeks. Just yesterday he finally made his first sound a weak, breathy noise that hardly resembles his previous voice. It's not entirely audible and leaves his throat sore if he talks for very long, but the fact that he's able to talk at all after such a short amount of time is impressive enough. Ever since his achievement yesterday, he's been incessantly croaking and rasping at his mother and Kaken practically non-stop. Soon, there's a knock on the door and Izuku opens it to see Kaminari and Kirishima's blinding grins on the other side. Midraya kun Kaminari cheers, wrapping Izuku in a tight hug that the smaller boy, eagerly returns. It's been too long, my dear friend, too long. You were here three days ago, you fucking phone charger, Kaken growls, punching Kirishima on the shoulder good-naturedly as he steps outside. Too long. Kaminari insists, then reluctantly steps back to let Kirishima ruffle as Yuku's hair. How you feeling, man? The redhead asks. Is Yuku smiles. Good, he croaks out the word, and, it isn't a lie. Even though he sounds horrible, he's just thrilled to be able to make any sounds at all. Eating is getting easier too, although he still has to be careful which foods he eats. And now that his friends are here, he couldn't be any happier. Kirishima gives him a toothy grin. Great. Well, let's get going then. Kaken takes Izuku's bag from him, despite his protests, and hikes it. Over his shoulder next to his own. As they start the journey to the school, Kaminari and Kirishima do most of the talking, the former loudly complaining about the brutal summer heat beating down on them. Meanwhile, Izuku takes note of their positioning, Kaminari and Kirishima walk on either side of him with their arms linked with his while Kakun brings up the rear, keeping him in the safest spot. He also occasionally notices in the distance a few, pro heroes that he doesn't recognize stop in their patrol to watch him walk. It's a bit excessive, he thinks, but at the same time he's also kind of relieved. This is the first time he's stepped out in public since the attack, but he's glad not to be feeling vulnerable or exposed. What safer place is there than in the arms of his friends? He smiles to himself and squeezes Kirishima and Kaminari, just a little bit closer. They arrive at without any trouble. Izuku didn't realize just how much he missed his school until he's once again walking within its hallways. Before they head over to the pool, they drop by the teacher's center to check in with Aizawa. Hey, Aizawa sensei. Kirishima greets, popping his head in the door, mission accomplished. Midraya comes here, all safe and sound, Aizawa looks at Izuku over Kirishima's head and nods. Good. You can use the pool until 5 p.m., yes, sir. Kirishima and Kaminari bow politely. Izuku hastily does too, rasping, thank you very much. Aizawa blinks. 
Izuku realizes that this is probably the first time the man has heard him speak in weeks. His face doesn't change, but Vlad King is here too, and he's more visibly upset, glancing, between Izuku and Aizawa with slightly widened eyes. Izuku shifts uncomfortably. Aizawa seems to share a look with Kakan that Izuku doesn't quite understand, but it makes Kakan straighten up purposefully beside him. After a moment, Aizawa simply dips his head and says, have fun. They head over to the swimming pool after that. As they get changed in the locker rooms, Izuku can't get his mind, off of the strange turn the encounter took. He supposes he should get used to things being weird for a bit. He doesn't like the odd tension in the air, when it's like everyone is reminded that things aren't okay, aren't perfect like they used to be, like oh right, he got attacked by a villain, that happened. Not that they forget, but. Izuku almost gets the feeling that they have a hard time, accepting that it actually happened. Maybe he does too. His fingers brush the bandages around his throat. He always keeps them on, only ever taking them off to shower. His wound has long since healed, of course, but he keeps his throat wrapped just to hide the scars. Since he's a healer in training, he has no shortage of bandages at home, some even in different colors. The long curls that he used, to almost always wear in a ponytail or a bun are constantly worn down now. Nobody questions it, not Inko, not Kakan, not any of his friends. Not even himself, really. He didn't like he couldn't stand looking at his scars, so he covered them up. Pulling his hair up made his neck feel exposed, so he wears it down now. Is he being weak, though? Avoiding things that scare him. But, no, they're a, part of him now, it's stupid to avoid them. It's stupid to pretend that this didn't happen. So, with a deep, shaky breath, he slowly unravels his bandages after slipping on his swim trunks. The others don't notice at first, Girishima still chattering excitedly to Kakan beside him. Surprisingly, it's Kaminari who notices first. Hey, Midraya-kun, did you Kaminari cuts himself off with a soft, oh, eyes widening as they lock on Izuku's marred throat. Girishima and Kakan glance over at the sudden pause and freeze. Izuku forces himself not to fidget and takes another deep breath, looking up at them, trying to seem unconcerned and probably failing. Kakan's jaw clenches. Oh, oh, I uh. Kaminari tries to shake himself out of his stupor. I, um, I I didn't. I. He swallows heavily. I, didn't know it would scar. His voice suddenly sounds a little wobbly. Oh, Izuku says as if he didn't notice, yeah, well. He shrugs helplessly and tries to smile, although it probably comes out more like a grimace. A bit of humor sparks in his eyes as he rasps, Miru Senpai says that scars build character. Silence meets his words. Izuku sweat drops. Kirishima opens his mouth, then blinks in, confusion. Wh what? I I don't know. Izuku shakes his head. Never mind. He trails off, unsure of what else to say. There's a pause in which the other three boys just gaze at him. Then, Kirishima slowly moves forward and wraps his arms around him in a hug. I know you're probably so tired of hearing this man, he whispers, but I'm so sorry. Izuku nods wordlessly, pressing his nose into the boy's shoulder. Behind him, Kaminari's eyes drop to the floor. Kakan's throat clicks as he swallows. Does it hurt? He grunts. Izuku pulls away and shakes his head. No, no, he reassures, it's fine, really. He shifts uncomfortably. Can can we go swimming now? Yeah. Yeah, sure, um. Kaminari looks uncertain, glancing at Kakan and Kirishima. Kakan glares at him lightly and huffs. These. Fuckface has decided to invite the whole class to surprise you again. He lowers his voice. But if you don't want no, no, it's okay. Izuku croaks, wincing when his throat gives a stab of pain. His vocal cords aren't strong enough to raise the volume of his voice yet it always disappears with a breathy wheeze and painful twinge. I'm. I'm okay with them seeing. Let's just let's just go, okay? 
I wanna have fun today. With that said, he grabs his towel and starts heading out the locker rooms. A few moments later, he hears the pattering footsteps of his friends following him. There's a long hallway leading to the pool, and he can already hear the rest of his classmates' excitable chatter coming from outside it. Despite his words, he can't help the way his heart rabbits in his chest. He really doesn't know why he's so nervous. These are his classmates, his friends. They already know what happened to him. So why does this feel so different? Ida spots him first, approaching with a bright, blinding grin on his face. Midraya Kun. You're late he freezes. Next is Saro, who waves him over, only to pause and frown. Then Totoraki turns around at Ida's call, a soft smile already on his face. It drops the next moment, mismatched eyes widening ever so slightly. Izuku lets out a quiet, weary sigh as all of his classmates' attention land on him, each one slowly coming to their own realization, eyes widening in horror. Kakin comes up beside him and he takes comfort in his friend's sturdy presence. The rest of his friends quickly gather around him, trying and failing not to too, obviously stare at his neck. Ah! That's why he's so nervous. Because this right here, this hideous, ugly scar is the blatant evidence of their failure. Not that he sees it that way, but he sure as hell knows his classmates well enough to know that they will see it that way. He can already see it in their eyes, the guilt, the horror, the sorrow, the self floating, all that because he was stupid, enough to take off his bandages. What was he thinking? He hates the way they're looking at him. It's like when they first heard him try to talk for the first time outside the hospital. No. Come on, Izuku. He opens his mouth. I'm Adori-kun. Ashido cries out, bouncing up to his side. She grins, but it's fake, and her eyes keep darting between his throat and his face as she stammers. How how, have you? How are you feet? Um. She abruptly shakes her head so rapidly he's afraid it might hurt. We have a spot for you. A sunbathing spot. See? She takes his hand and points at one of the chairs lined up on the side of the pool. There's a towel laid out on it and an umbrella angled perfectly so the sun won't be in his eyes. Your air rocker perks up. It'll be super comfy. You can relax all afternoon, and we've got some cold juice for your throat and we can play music and she and Ashido start pulling him towards the chair, but stop when he refuses to move. He smiles apologetically and politely tugs his hands away, taking a step back. I. I'd like to say something, he croaks, turning to face the rest of his classmates. They all watch him with rapt attention, leaning close to hear his quiet, voice. He pauses for a moment, gazing at the ground as he struggles to find the right words, then lifts his head and begins with, I just want you to know. I don't. I don't blame any of you for for what happened to me. I don't care what you think, it's it's no one's fault but Shigaraki's. He swallows and gestures to his scarred throat, rasping, it's just. This is just something that I we have, to live with. Okay? I I know this this all sucks, but I'd like to move on, I'm trying to move on. But it doesn't help. The way you guys look at me like I'm wounded, the way you treat me like I'm made of glass that doesn't help. His voice is starting to fade from stress he's not used to saying more than a few words at a time but he determinedly pushes on. It doesn't help. I'm a hero course, student too, you know? I'd like to be treated like one. He instantly regrets saying the last part as soon as he says it because well, shit, now they look even more guilty. Yerazu lifts her hands to her mouth with a small gasp, eyes watery. Ida grits his teeth and Totoraki lowers his eyes. He's about to open his mouth and he doesn't know, apologize? Take it back question mark when suddenly hey, Midraya-kun? Izuku blinks in surprise. Is that? Shinta-kun? What are? His mind goes blank. The crowd of class 1A students partner Shinta makes his way through, his usual lazy smirk on his face. Gazing down at Izuku through hooded eyes. He orders, pinch yourself. Izuku pinches himself and blinks, mind clearing. 
He gazes up at Shinsu, gawking. Did you just? Kakin stiffens behind him. Did you just? Kirishima grabs him before he can pounce on the purple-haired boy. I'll kill you. Shinsu arches a brow at him, unimpressed, then glances back down at his Yuku. Feel better now? His Yuku gapes at him for a few more moments, then slowly smiles. Yeah, he croaks, unsuccessfully trying to stifle a sniffle. Shinsu's smirk softens and he glances away. Yerazu steps forward, placing a hand on his Yuku's shoulder. I'm sorry, Midraya-kun. Oh, please, he wheezes, I'm so sick of apologies. No more apologizing. She smiles and huffs softly. All right, I'm sore she cuts herself off. He lets out a breathy giggle. Recollecting herself, Yerazu asks, What would you like to do, Midraya-kun? He swallows, resisting a grimace as his throat aches, and tilts his head. What are you guys going to do? The boys, are going to utilize the pool to participate in endurance training, eat a pipe sup. We are? Shinsu questions. And the girls are going to play volleyball on the other side of the pool, Yerazu says. That sounds nice, Izuku says immediately, can I join? Of course. Can I join too? Shinsu asks a bit desperately, but Ida merely lets out a deep, boisterous laugh and drops a large hand on his shoulder. Nonsense. You want to transfer into class 1A, don't you, Shinsu-kun? You need all the extra training you can get. Shinsu gives his Yuku a pleading look as he leads him away to his doom. His Yuku simply smiles innocently and waves. The others look like they still want to apologize, but after hearing what his Yuku said, they just decide to smile and slowly shuffle back to whatever they were doing. A few pat him on the back, and Ojiro tells him that it's good to see him again, but after that it just turns into a relatively normal afternoon. Playing volleyball with the girls is fun, as Yuku isn't particularly good at the sport nor at swimming, but the game isn't really competitive and he spends more time goofing around with Ashido, Yuraraka, and Hagakure than getting any scores. The cool water of the pool feels great in contrast to the stifling summer heat. Although eventually they all get out and take a break when Ida offers them orange juices. The boys are all sitting down in the shade, resting after their intense endurance training. Izuku sits at the edge of the pool, letting his feet splash in the water as he sips his juice. The cool liquid slides down his throat, soothing his aching muscles. He's really been talking a bit too much today. The juice feels nice though. Feet patter beside him. Ashido sits down pink thighs brushing his. She doesn't say anything at first, content to sit in companionable silence. Izuku takes another sip, idly glancing around the pool. He spots Totoraki leaning against the wall, head tipped back as he finishes off the remains of his own drink. Green eyes lock on a bead of juice as it dribbles out of the corner of the boy's mouth, slipping over the sharp cut of his jawline and sliding across his Adam's apple. Izuku gulps, Got your eye on anyone? Ashido asks suddenly. Izuku starts choking on his drink. Ashido jumps in surprise and thumps his back. As she does, she glances around, gaze landing on Totoraki. Her eyes, practically sparkle. Oh? No, Izuku rasps. Oh? Please don't. Oh? Ashido-kun, please. Everyone. Do you want to see which of the boys can swim 50 meters the fastest? Ida shouts. Yes. Izuku yelps, but his voice breaks so all that he gets out is the Y and like one third of the E. He's not off the hook that easy, though. Minus Midori Kun, of course. Ashido says, standing up, dragging, Izuku up with her, he's tired. Besides, you meatheads probably wanna use your quirks, right? Ida nods and Ashido grins. Great. We're gonna go sunbathe, then. And Yushi pokes is Yuku's chest, grinning as she leans closer, looking downright evil as she whispers, are gonna tell me all about your little crush? There's no point in fighting it. This is it. This is his fate. Death by Ashido. He, glances over his shoulder and finds himself locking eyes with Shinsu, 
giving the purple-haired boy a pleading look as Ashido drags him away. Chinsu simply smiles innocently and waves. Fucker. Still, he supposes it's not all bad. Ashido has the decency to let him relax first before she tears into him. They take turns rubbing sunscreen into each other's skin her hand pauses over the scar on his, ribs curiously, but she doesn't ask about it and she lends him a spare pair of heart-shaped sunglasses because he forgot to bring his own. Then, they're lying in the sun, each with a can of cold orange juice in their hands while Izuku rants about his totally non-existent crush on Totoraki as they watch said boy completely demolish their other classmates in the 50 meter race. I mean, it's not, like I'm in love with him, Izuku rasps, cause I'm not. He just. Makes my heart funny sometimes. Mm. Ashido sounds unimpressed. And what would you call that? I don't know. Izuku grumbles. I guess. I mean, I'm not gonna deny that the guy is pretty. His face is nice. So's his hair. His eyes trail back to Totoraki, who's currently sliding his way across the pool for the fifth time. Hard muscles ripple over broad shoulders, sweaty skin gleaming in the sun. Izuku's eyes drop down to Totoraki's thighs, watching them tense up to jump and catch himself at the edge of the pool. Ashido smirks. He's got a pretty nice butt too. Izuku scowls. I hate you. She cackles. Unsurprisingly, Kaken turns the race into a competition between him and Totoraki, seeing it as a chance to finish their unfinished business from the other day. Unfortunately for him, this little competition is also interrupted by a very grouchy feline teacher who bursts in at the last second and erases their quirks. It's 5 p.m., Aizawa grunts. Your pool use time has ended. Hurry up and go home. Kaminari tries protesting, only to quickly shut up when Aizawa's eyes flash dangerously. Did you say something? Kaken bares his teeth and snarls wordlessly. Once again. His efforts to defeat Totoraki have been interrupted. Clearly he's pissed about it. Totoraki, on the other hand, doesn't look too bothered. Instead, he hops off the diving board and approaches Izuku with a friendly expression. Ashido tenses up excitedly beside him. Midraya, Totoraki asks, how are you doing? He comes to a stop afoot, away from his chair giving Izuku a perfect view of his chiseled abeus and sweaty skin, flushed from exercise. Izuku's cheeks burn. He opens his mouth to reply, but nothing comes out. Thankfully, Aizawa's arrival saves him from having to respond. Midraya kun The man's tall form casts a shadow over him. Izuku lifts his heart-shaped sunglasses and smiles up at his teacher. How may I help you? Aizawa-sensei. He croaks. Aizawa's eyes roam over him, lingering on his scarred throat for a moment before saying, There was a bit of a problem with one of the heroes that patrols your area, so I'm escorting you home today. There's an odd tone to his voice when he says problem, but he doesn't offer any more information, so as Yuku shrugs and gets up. To Totoraki, he smiles and rasps, and I'm, fine, Totoraki-kun, thanks. He winces and rubs his throat. Kind of overdid it with my voice though, so if I'm a bit quiet on the walk home that's why. He says the last part more to Aizawa than Totoraki. The man nods. Still, Totoraki isn't dissuaded by his lack of talking. He stays by his side as they walk back to the locker room in companionable silence, watching as Kirishima and Kaken bicker, loudly ahead of them. They change and regroup with Aizawa at the gate and start walking and... Totoraki still isn't leaving. Neither is Kirishima. Don't you guys have to go home? Aizawa asks in a very bored tone. Uh, yeah, we are going home, Kirishima replies innocently. Totoraki-kun, I know for a fact that you live in the complete opposite direction, Aizawa says bluntly. Totoraki doesn't move, from Izuku's side. No. I don't. Yes, you do, their teacher replies, your address is in your student file. Totoraki pauses for the barest, most unnoticeable second, then says, I moved. Izuku stifles a snort with his hand while Kaken guffaws obnoxiously. Aizawa arches a brow. 
The school is very good at updating their addresses fairly quickly. I moved this week. Silence. Then, really, Totoraki-kun? Izuku can barely hold back his laughter. Azawa just sounds so... unimpressed. But also so astounded. Like he's so surprised that Totoraki of all people is behaving this way. Which, yeah, Totoraki isn't really one to act silly with the teachers, but he can be stubborn when he wants to be. And right now Totoraki wants to walk home with his Yuku and he's gonna do what he needs to in order, to be able to do that. Aizawa and Totoraki both stop walking and stare at each other over his Yuku's head. Two blank faces, devoid of emotion. Two unstoppable forces of incredible stubborn spirit. Kakin's not even bothering to hide the fact that he's laughing his ass off. Kirishima looks like he wants to laugh but also values his life. Meanwhile, Izuku is stuck glancing between his teacher and his friend. They look very similar. First Shinsu, now Totoraki. How many secret love children does Aizawa have? In the end, Totoraki's stubborn will wins out over Aizawa's not giving enough fucks about it and he gets to escort Izuku all the way home. In hindsight, Izuku is very glad that Totoraki hasn't decided to pursue him romantically, because if he did, he would stand no chance against his bullheadedness. The first day of summer camp arrives. Izuku meets with a recovery girl in her office beforehand, hugging his mentor tightly since he hasn't seen her in a good while. She smiles with only a tinge of sadness when she hears him speak and begins lecturing him, telling him to be careful with his cork and to only use it under Aizawa's supervision and to take it easy and not push his voice, so much but to keep up, with the exercises his speech therapist is having him do. So you want me to talk, but you don't want me to talk? He arches a brow teasingly. She gives him a smack with her cane for his sass. Class B meets up with them outside by the buses. Izuku squeaks in surprise when Tetsuya Tetsu scoops him up in a tight hug, the other students swarming around him. Hey, Midraya kun good to see you, man, Hanuki says. We were all really worried when we heard what happened, Kendu says, we wanted to visit, but Aizawa sensei said there were too many people. How are you doing? I'm alright, Izuku rasps. A couple of people flinch and Kendu's eyes flicker to his scar briefly but then she straightens up and smiles. That's good, she says a bit softer, I'm glad you could join us on this trip, we're all stronger with you. Izuku blinks, then flushes. It's surprising, especially since he doesn't really know Kendu that well, but he's flattered either way. The two classes get on separate buses. Since it will be a fairly long drive and no doubt a loud one Izuku will have to choose his seat wisely. As much as he loves his friends, he doesn't think he has enough energy to deal with the because quad for any extended period of time today. He had yet another nightmare about Shigaraki last night blood red eyes, long fingers, pain, pain, pain that left him feeling more drained than usual, so right now he wants to save as much energy as he can for the day ahead. So that means no to sitting next to Ashido, Kirishima, Kaminari, Kakin, say, maybe Saro, he can be kind of chill when he wants to be. But he also can get swept up pretty easily in the excitement of his other classmates. And with all the buzz that's currently going on, he's not a reliable option. The choice is obvious then. Stubbornly ignoring the stupid little flutter in his heart, Izuku goes to sit beside Totoraki near the back of the bus. The other boy glances up with a soft smile that nearly makes Izuku drop, dead right on the spot and fuck this was a bad idea. But the bus is already moving so he's stuck here now. The first few minutes are alright. Totoraki asks how he's doing and as Yuku replies with a casual fine, how are you? Typical small talk. Something Totoraki has never really been one for. Soon five minutes lapses into ten, and as Yuku finds himself not really knowing what else to say. They've, long since fallen into a somewhat uncomfortable silence well, uncomfortable for as Yuku. Totoraki looks unbothered as usual. Izuku opens his mouth, then closes it. He lets out a small, frustrated sigh through his nose. When did talking to Totoraki become so hard anyway? It shouldn't be. 
Totoraki is his friend. Before. Before anything else, Totoraki is his friend. This is all Ashido's fault. Ashido, and his stupid teenager hormones making his stupid teenage boy mind so confused. He glances at Totoraki. The other boy is gazing out the window, the warm summer sun beaming down on him, making the white of his hair glow. Izuku glances away quickly, face heating up. It's Totoraki's fault too, for being so stupidly handsome. Fuck. No, come on. There's gotta be something more to Totoraki he likes, than just his looks. Sure, Izuku has long ago accepted that he thinks Totoraki is pretty, but that doesn't warrant a crush as Ashido so eloquently described it. So. So there must be something else to it, right? What does Izuku like about Totoraki? It's a loaded question. His brows furrow in concentration, putting a finger to his lips as he ponders. The bus is noisy, his classmates chattering, loudly around him, making it hard to think. Sighing, he glances up, accidentally making eye contact with Ashido. She grins wickedly, eyes darting between him and Totoraki, and flashes him a thumbs up. He's got a pretty nice butt. Izuku hates his friends. He scowls down at his lap, ignoring Ashido's high-pitched cackle. After another long moment, he sneaks a glance at Totoraki again. Something, within him aches. He wishes. Whatever this is wasn't so hard to figure out. He misses what they used to have. He misses. Not being so weird around Totoraki. Is this his fault? It is, isn't it? His fault for making things weird. Hopefully Totoraki doesn't notice too much of a difference. He already made enough of a fool of himself by nearly downright molesting the poor boy in that closet back, during the training exercise with All Might. Izuku's face burns just thinking of that. He shakes his head and sighs just a bit too loudly. Totoraki glances at him. Are you alright? Oh yeah, I'm fine, Izuku wheezes. Unfortunately, since the bus is nothing but a cacophony of rowdy teenagers, his feeble voice gets drowned out. Totoraki leans in closer to hear him. What was that? He asks, Izuku moves his lips to his ear and rasps as loudly as he can, I said I'm fine. Just thinking. Totoraki nods and Izuku's about to pull away when he accidentally inhales and the most curious scent tickles his nose. It smells. Almost like jasmine, with a hint of fruity citrus and an undertone of vanilla. It's a bizarre combination of scents, but it's completely alluring and it makes Izuku falter. His sudden lack of movement confuses Totoraki, who pulls away enough to look at his face. Midraya? What's wrong? It clicks. Of course. While it's not as obvious like with Yerazu, if Totoraki's father is the number two hero, then he must be a rich boy. And a rich boy like him no doubt possesses a number of fine colognes. Izuku smiles. You smell good. Totoraki stares at him. 2. Izuku's fascination, his cheeks slowly start to turn pink. It's cute. Um Totoraki coughs, turning his face away. Thanks. Izuku's smile widens and Totoraki averts his gaze. They fall into another silence, but this one is much more comfortable for Izuku. He finds his mind going over their interactions, cataloging things that stick out to him. Like Totoraki's scent. And when his cheeks get pink. Things he likes. And yes, that may include things like his muscles or his butt. But it could also include things like how soft his hair is. Izuku knows how soft Totoraki's hair as he felt it back during the internship week. Actually, that was a rather nice moment between them. Ignoring the fact that he panicked and stepped on a fork immediately afterwards. Totoraki had been very kind to him while he well, while they were both injured. He brought their meals to Izuku's bed and ate with him and kept him company while he couldn't work. That was very nice of him. Not to mention the fact that he saved him and Ida from stain. Totoraki had already saved his life multiple times during USJ, and to this day he continues to impress Izuku with his strength and bravery. And. Izuku supposes, 
He also really likes the quiet side of Totoraki. His calm, mellow personality, so different from the rest of his friends. That he always has someone to sit with when he's not quite feeling as energetic as he needs to be in order to deal with the because quent. The complete opposite of Kaken, who's been stuck to him like glue practically his whole life. It's so different from what he's used to, but, nice. He likes it. Izuku glances at Totoraki again, who's looking decidedly less collected than usual, expression forcefully impassive except there's steam rising from his left side. It's fogging up the window, but not many people are noticing, least of all Totoraki. Izuku blinks and opens his mouth to bring attention to it, then sniffs. Totoraki's steam is amplifying the scent of his cologne, Izuku pauses, then shrugs and decides to let it be. He should make a list. No, two lists. One for things he likes about Totoraki's body, and one for things he likes about Totoraki's personality. That way, he can organize his feelings better and see if it's more of like a physical attraction type crush or a romantic type crush. Once he figures that out, then he can go from there. That's a good, plan, right? He already has so much to work with, he just thought up a bunch of stuff right now. With a task in mind and the scent of Totoraki's rich boy cologne spurring him on, the rest of the bus ride goes by fairly quickly for Izuku. Chapter 28 When they reach the rest stop, Aizawa stops him from getting off the bus. He blinks up at his teacher in confusion, but Aizawa simply pulls him aside and tells Totoraki to keep moving. Totoraki obeys, but Izuku doesn't miss the way his eyes narrow slightly. Once everyone has filed off the bus, Aizawa turns to him. He doesn't say anything at first, but his sharp gaze is enough to make Izuku straighten up. Finally, Aizawa says, I know recovery girl already used her quirk on you and you've spent the past week and a half resting, but I don't think. I need to remind you that you've gone through a traumatic experience. Your mother has told me how hard you've been working with your speech therapy, but you're not going to get better right away. So, while I will let you do some training during this week, I do not want to see you pushing yourself in any way, shape, or form. I don't care if you think you're falling behind it doesn't matter. Your, physical and emotional well-being comes first. And if something's wrong, or if you need something, anything, you come to me. Understand? Izuku pauses and nods. Good, Aizawa says, now, stay by my side. He turns and steps off the bus. Taken aback, Izuku hastily follows. Why does he need to stay by his side now? Isn't this supposed to be a rest stop? Although, it doesn't really look like one, the rest of his classmates are confused as well. To Izuku's surprise, Totoraki is standing with Kaken, both looking very suspicious. When they glance over at Aizawa and Izuku, the latter realizes that Totoraki must have caught on to Aizawa's trick when he prevented the healer from joining the rest of the students. But what kind of logical ruse is this? He gets his answer a moment later. Lock on, with these sparkling gazes. Stingingly cute and, cat-like. Wild wild pussycats. Izuku is the only one who visibly perks up. It's the wild wild pussycats. They're the veteran team that specializes in mountain rescues. Oh, he wishes he brought his journals he has so many questions. The ever-present ache in his throat is the only thing that makes him think twice about spouting them all right now. After introductions, Mandalay goes on to explain, that the lodge they will be staying in is at the base of the mountain all the way on the other side of the forest which they own. Realization slowly begins to dawn on the students. A few start to shuffle back to the bus, but Mandalay grins. It actually makes Izuku a little nervous. Kitties who don't make it back by 12.30 won't get any lunch. Then Pixie Bob proceeds to use her quirk to manipulate the earth beneath his classmates' feet and throw them off the mountain. Izuku is pretty sure his heart stops for a good 5 seconds. Once his brain finally processes the fact that yes, this woman, this grown ass woman that is not only an adult but also a pro hero just threw a bunch of teenagers off a mountain and thought that was a good idea, all he manages to sputter is, are you, insane? 
All three adults turn to him in surprise. Izuku has never been more furious in his life as he marches right up to Pixie Bob and gets right in her face. Do you have any idea how reckless that was? How many injuries you could have caused? They could have gotten seriously hurt from a fall from that height. Or from all the debris crashing down on them. They could have been buried alive. They could have snapped their necks. They could have hit their heads. There are so many ways people can die from falling, even people with powerful quirks. What the hell were you thinking? Damn it, you're a pro hero. You should be more careful than this. Pixie Bob stares at him with wide eyes. He isn't sure if it's because she's not used to getting yelled at or because his voice sounds like he threw a bunch of broken glass into a blender, but right now he's too pissed off to care. He continues on with his tirade, scolding her harshly for her recklessness and ignoring Aizawa's occasional attempts at interrupting. Pixie Bob swallows, eyes darting towards Mandalay briefly, before she suddenly bursts out into high-pitched laughter. It's enough to startle the Zuko out of his rant. Wow, 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 Irasher head. You've got yourself one feisty healer. She cackles, recovery girl is really rubbing off on him. She ruffles Izuku's hair with one gloved paw. The green it flushes. Holy shit, wait a minute, he just yelled at a pro hero. Oh. I I'm so so sorry, that that was so rude of me he tries to apologize, but his voice gives out. Before, he could barely talk properly, no way were his, poor scarred vocal cords ready to handle yelling. He really pushed himself too hard. Right after Aizawa gave him a lecture about not pushing himself too hard. Shit. Thankfully, Pixie Bob doesn't seem too offended. Don't worry, you're not the first healer to make me piss my pants. She grins. And I'm sure you won't be the last. Besides, it's always good to see such a fiery spirit in such a young, kitten. Izuku's cheeks are still burning, and he doesn't quite know what to make of her calling him a kitten, but he's just grateful she's not upset. Mandalay walks towards the railing and Izuku hastily joins her, peeking over the edge of the mountain. He wants to call out, but his throat aches terribly, so he settles for peering down at his classmates worriedly. They seem fine, if a little dirty and bruised, but most gaze up at him with dumb happy smiles. Damn, Midraya kun came in Ari whistles. That was kinda hot, I'm not gonna lie. Saro grins. Izuku somehow flushes even harder. Oh god, they heard that? Oh yeah, I'm turned, Shinsu says bluntly. Ashido snickers, who knew Midori kun had such a beast mode underneath that cute facade. Never mind, I'm not worried about them. Izuku grumbles under his breath, low enough only Mandalay can hear. She laughs and he turns away, trudging back over to Aizawa and Pixie Bob. As he does, he spots a young boy with a spiked hat staring at him. He'd noticed the kid earlier when the pussycats had arrived, but they didn't introduce him. Maybe a relative? He's staring at Izuku with an intense gaze, like he doesn't quite know what to make of him. Well, shit. Yeah, if he is related to the pussycats, then he probably isn't happy that Izuku just yelled at Pixie Bob. Great. What was Izuku thinking? Midraya kun. Tearing his gaze away from the boy, Izuku quickly makes his way back to Aizawa's side. The man looks down at him with hooded eyes and Izuku ducks his head guiltily, scuffling his shoe in the dirt. There's a pause, then a heavy sigh. Aizawa's hand lands on the back of his head, gently ruffling his curls. You're gonna be a menace once you get your license, you know that? He huffs good-naturedly. Izuku flushes and looks up at him, smiling. Aizawa's lips twitch upwards as his hand slips off Izuku's head. Pixie Bop. They're all yours. They both glance over as Mandalay approaches them, eyes sparkling with excitement. This is going to be so much fun. I can't wait to see how they'll do with this. And the rest of the activities too. She turns to Izuku and grins. If you think Pixie Bob is cruel, just wait till you see what Eraserhead plans to put your classmates through. Izuku glances up at his teacher warily. Aizawa doesn't even blink. They'll be fine. Mandalay's grin widens, then she seems to 
sober up slightly. It really is a crazy schedule though, Eraser. Well, we're planning to have them acquire early what they normally would get at the beginning of their second year, so it's going to be crazy no matter what, Aizawa replies dully, permits to use their quirks in the time of an emergency a provisional license allowing them to work as heroes. With villains being so active right, now, they also need to learn how to defend themselves. Mandalay's eyes flicker over to his Yuku fleetingly, but he catches it. A knot forms in his stomach. Ah, I see, she says. A loud explosion from the forest distracts them briefly. Kakin's doing, no doubt. Pixie Bob jumps up and down in excitement, but Aizawa turns back to the bus with a tired sigh. His Yuku follows him, and Mandalay calls for, the boy Koda, he learns to return with them. There's no point in sitting near the back of the bus with it being so empty now, so he takes a seat in the front with the adults. The muscles in his throat twinge and burn uncomfortably from being so overstressed, so he's more than ready to just sit back and let the heroes do all the talking, but that plan is apparently foiled when Mandalay plops, down next to him with a wide smile and bright, glittering eyes that remind him vaguely of Nejires. So, little kitten, tell me about yourself. Are you excited for the boot camp? She asks eagerly. His Yuku blinks, then hesitantly replies in a hoarse rasp, Ye. Yeah, I. I am. He grimaces in pain and Mandalay frowns. Aizawa comes to hover over his shoulder. You stressed out your voice when you, yelled at Pixie Bob, didn't you? His Yuku winces guiltily. To the Mandalay, Aizawa explains, his vocal cords were damaged during the attack, so he's been attending speech therapy to rebuild their strength. Ah, right, Mandalay sighs through her nose, we heard about what happened at the mall. She shakes her head. Villains going after healers. How pathetic can they get? She scoffs, then puts, a paw on Izuku's shoulder. Don't worry, little kitten. We'll teach you all our moves. By the end of this week, you'll be as swift as a cheetah and as powerful as a lioness. She swipes her claws and grins somewhat fairly. Izuku smiles and takes out his phone, typing, thank you. She doesn't seem to mind communicating with him that way during the bus ride. He apologizes again for yelling at, Pixie Bob, but she waves it off and starts asking about his quirk. He explains, and then asks about hers and Pixie Bob's. His inner fanboy starts to come out a bit as she talks and he starts to rapidly type out more in-depth and analytical questions. Mandalay blinks in surprise when she reads his phone, then smiles and answers. All the while, Izuku doesn't notice the odd gaze Kota sends his way, they reach the facility, which is unsurprisingly large and luxurious, and getting settled. Mandalay gives Izuku and Aizawa a tour of the place and then they set about making ramen for lunch. Noticing that Mandalay is taking out a relatively small pot, Izuku frowns. Tugging on Aizawa's sleeve to get his attention, he types out, what about the others? They'll be here soon, won't they? We need to, make a lot more food. Aizawa blinks slowly, expression unchanging except for the barest twitch of his lip. Oh. Yeah. They're not gonna get here anytime soon. Izuku tilts his head, gazing up at him imploringly. Threatening to take away their lunch would motivate them to get out of the forest faster. Izuku stares at him for a long moment before turning back to his phone. And being chased by, quirk-powered monsters wouldn't. Aizawa reads, then raises an eyebrow at his cheekiness. Izuku wrinkles his nose petulantly. You knew they wouldn't be able to get here by lunchtime. We'll cook dinner for them, Aizawa says dismissively, trying to end the conversation by turning away, but his Yuku grabs his arm. It's not good to skip meals, especially not teenagers that happen to be heroes in training. They need all the energy they can get and food is fuel. Skipping a meal can cause low blood sugar, which can make you feel sluggish and weak as well as increase sweating and irritability. It can also affect concentration because the main fuel for our brains is glucose alright, alright, I get it. Aizawa pushes his phone away and his Yuku fumbles not to drop it. The teacher, turns away with a snort, geez, 
Recovery girl really is rubbing off, on you. Clutching his phone tightly, Izuku sticks his tongue out at Aizawa's back. When he looks up, he notices Kota watching from beside the door. Smiling, he presses a finger to his lips in a SHH motion. The boy startles, then glances between him and Aizawa still walking away. He opens and closes his mouth a couple of times, not quite looking like he knows how to react, then presses his lips, together and ducks out of the room. Izuku's a bit disheartened, but he tries not to take it too personally. Maybe the kid's just shy? He was a rather nervous little boy himself when he was young. They've got all week to get to know each other. Lunch is a quiet affair, and then there's not much to do while they continue waiting for class 1A to show up, but a couple hours later they start preparing, for dinner. Mandalay asks if he's any good at cooking and, well, it's not that he's never tried to learn. He has. Kakin has tried to teach him many times how to cook. But for some reason he just. Sucks at it. It's disgraceful, really, especially since Kakin is so good at it. You'd think growing up alongside a person so talented in the art of cooking that he'd be able to pick up on some things. But no. Kakin banned Izuka from the kitchen after he tried to boil some udon and it ended up catching on fire. He still isn't quite sure how that happened. There was water in the pot and everything. After shamefully telling the flaming Yudan story, Izuku is put on vegetable washing duty and, later, after some arguing with Aizawa how can I ever expect to do surgery one day if I can't even cut, vegetables without injuring myself? This is good practice, vegetable cutting duty. He pretends not to notice the annoyingly close eye Aizawa is keeping on him the entire time. Cooking and cutting are two different things. He never said he was bad at cutting things. Just because he has a habit of accidentally setting foods on fire doesn't mean he loops, he almost sliced his finger there. Focus, Izuku, focus. Reaffirming his grip on the knife, Izuku continues slicing away at the carrot, humming innocently and ignoring the way Aizawa's narrowed gaze burns holes in the back of his head. By the time Class 1A finally makes it to the lodge, the sun is already starting to set painting the sky in orange and red hues. Pixie Bob arrived not too long ago, and now she, Mandalay, Aizawa, Izuku, and Koda wait outside for the students to return. The rustling of leaves announces their arrival, and Izuku winces as his precious classmates come limping out of the tree line. Wow, that took you guys a while. Pixie Bob crows, we thought you guys would be back here in three hours. A few cry out and protest, but most are just too tired and completely ignore her jab. Midraya kun Kirishima whines. Midraya kun Kaminari whines even more pathetically, reaching out and making a childish grabby motion with his hands. Izuku glances at Aizawa for permission and, when the man nods, bounces over to Kaminari, wrapping the boy up in a hug. As soon as their skin makes contact. His quirk activates, and as Yuku focuses on keeping the flow steady and controlled, Kaminari lets out a very inappropriate moan, practically melting in his arms. As Yuku giggles and stumbles under his weight when his friend sags against him. MMMNN, you're an angel, he sighs against his neck, breath tickling him. Thanks, as Yuku rasps, did you short circuit? Once, Kaminari mumbles, still hugging him. But it took a while to get to that point, and I came out of it pretty quickly. Diet's working, then. MMM. Oi, oi, it's my turn to hug Madraya Kun. Kirishima grumbles, unusually irritable as he pulls Kaminari away from his Yuku. Unbothered, the greenhead smiles sweetly and snuggles up to his red haired friend, wrapping his arms around his torso and tucking his head under his chin as he lets his quirk activate. Just like with Kaminari, Kirishima practically sags in his arms. Oh my, god, Kirishima damn near moans, tightening his hold on his Yuku and burying his nose in his curls. Dude, you are amazing. His Yuku smiles against his chest. Hearing his stomach rumble, he rasps, and guess what? What? We cooked dinner too. I love you. Kirishima sounds like he could cry. Oh, you did? 
is Yuku glances up at Yerazu's voice. She looks immensely relieved she also looks like she's about to pass out. Midori-kun. Ashido cries out, practically draping herself over him, my body's dying. My elbows are killing me, Saro complains. Kakin suddenly appears by Kirishima's shoulder, explosive energy only slightly dulled. Oi, back off, extras. It's your own fault for getting injured in the first place. Izuku stares at him. The blonde grinds his teeth, then thrusts out his wrists. They fucking ache, though, he grumbles. As the rest of his classmates start flocking over to Izuku, Aizawa calls out, don't overwhelm him. This is the only time he'll heal you this week so enjoy it. From tomorrow onward you'll have to heal the natural way. Izuku's mind skids to a halt. Taking out his phone, he frantically types out in all caps plus big bold letters his response, then, shows it to Yuraraka to read. She giggles before calling out, Aizawa sensei. Midraya kun asks, and I quote, what? A few other students chuckle too while Aizawa sighs, addressing Izuku standing amidst the crowd, I don't want them to start relying on your quirk so much. It'll teach them to avoid getting injured. Izuku frowns and Aizawa adds, but of course if there's an emergency then you'll be allowed to use your quirk. Izuku's still a little disgruntled at the surprise he's going to need to have a talk with Aizawa about telling him about things beforehand. He's had one too many surprises today but for now he simply nods and goes about healing his classmates. Ida has a nasty gash on his leg that's causing him to limp heavily and Asui's tongue is littered with cuts and scrapes. But most of the exhaustion is merely caused by quirk overuse. While he didn't pack his full healer costume, he was allowed to bring his medical pouches with him. Aoyama and Uraraka whimper with relief when he hands them both anti-nausea pills after healing them. He also gives Sato and Yerazu, and Ashido when she begs, some gummy bears just to hold them down until dinner. Students like Hagakure, Shinsu, Jiru, and Koda apparently couldn't do much against Pixie Bob's Earth Beasts and stayed behind the pack, so they mostly have scrapes and bruises and are easy enough to treat. Meanwhile, the heroes commend them for their relatively quick action and tell them that they'll discuss their performances after dinner. Now revitalized, Kirishima perks up and notices Kota standing a few feet away. Oh, by the way, I've been wondering, he says, tilting his head, whose kid is that? Mandalay glances at Kota. Oh no, he's not one of ours. He's my cousin's kid. She smiles and gestures to the boy. Come on, Kota. Greet everyone. To Izuku's surprise, Kota glares sullenly. Not deterred. Kirishima approaches him with a toothy grin. Hey, there, Kota-kun. I'm Kirishima Jairu from High, school's hero course. Nice to meet you Kota makes to punch him in the balls, but Kirishima still hyped up from the training and now no longer exhausted instinctively reacts by activating his quirk. So when Kota punches him, he's, well, hard. Ack. Shit. Kirishima curses, then slaps a hand over his mouth. I mean, shoot. Sorry, kid, are you alright? Is your hand hurt? He worriedly reaches, for Kota, but the boy stumbles away from him. Piss off. He snaps, cradling his hand to his chest. I don't need your stupid help, hero. Kota. Mandalay hovers over him. Are you alright? I'm fine. He spits angrily, but his eyes are clearly watery. It doesn't hurt. You shouldn't have punched him, Mandalay says disapprovingly, he has a hardening quirk. Not to mention it's rude. Let me, see your hand. I said it's fine. Leave me alone. Kota whirls around and starts stomping away. Mandalay looks upset, but she makes no move to follow him. Kirishima shifts his weight. Uh, I'm really sorry don't be, Mandalay interrupts, he's not the easiest to deal with. Izuku hesitates, then takes a step forward. It would be bad if he broke a finger, he croaks, mind if I try checking, out his hand? She nods gratefully. Please. Izuku trots after Kota, catching up to him just before he reaches the doors of the facility. 
The boy tenses up when he hears footsteps approaching and whips around to glare at him, only slightly lowering his hackles when he realizes who it is. What? He snaps, voice much too hostile for a five-year-old. Izuku pauses, then kneels down a couple feet away, leaving some distance between them so Koda can choose to come to him. He reaches out with one hand, palm up, and smiles kindly. I just wanted to see if your hand was hurt, he says, soft and hoarse, barely above a whisper. Kota's eyes flicker to his scar. I'm training to be a healer, so it's my job to make sure no one is injured. Kota stubbornly holds his gaze for a few moments, then, drops his eyes. He cradles his injured hand to his chest. Doesn't hurt that bad, he mumbles petulantly. But then he reluctantly trudges over to Izuku and places his smaller hand in his palm. The greenet surprises himself by how quickly he's able to slam down on the hose to stop the flow of energy. It's almost immediate. Usually, he has trouble with smaller injuries, since his quirk often heals, them before he has time to shut off the flow. He thought after all this time he'd be out of practice too. Oh well. He won't look a gift horse in the mouth. With the flow stopped, he's able to sense Kota's natural energy swirling around the points of injury in his hand. While he wasn't really concerned about Kota hitting Kirishima hard enough to fracture anything, he does know that finger bones are, particularly fragile, especially in, those in children, so he just wanted to double check. Lucky for Kota, that doesn't seem to be the case. Looks like you've just got some bruising, is Yuku muses letting his energy flow into Kota's hand. The boy's eyes widen as the pain disappears in seconds. There you go, all better. He lets go of Kota's hand. Kota looks at it in awe, flexing his fingers a couple of times, then turns his, wide-eyed gaze to Izuku. Izuku smiles. Kota's cheeks flush and he quickly glances away. Thanks, he mutters. No problem, Izuku says, and don't worry. You're not the first person to punch Kirishima kun and I doubt you'll be the last. Kota glances at him. Izuku winks. Kota quickly glances away again, ear tips red, but Izuku thinks he can see a small smile on the boy's face. Izuku rejoins his classmates with an even bigger smile on his face. Kakin arches an eyebrow. Why? He grunts. Izuku tilts his chin up in pride. Kids love me. Once everyone is healed, Aizawa orders the students to get their luggage off of the bus and get settled before dinner. Izuku wants to help, but Aizawa tells him to just sit down and wait for the others. You just healed a bunch of people, he says, take, it easy. Izuku reluctantly obeys. Out of respect. Totally not because his legs are starting to shake just a little bit. No way. Dinner is delicious. Despite not having done as much exercise as his classmates, Izuku still manages to outheat a good number of his friends. It started to become a sort of competition at this point within the because Gwent, a point of pride with him. He still has to be careful with what he eats, of course, what with the trauma to his throat and all, but there's plenty of rice, curry, and soups to go around. They all laugh and chatter excitedly. Izuku listening as his friends rehash with dramatics their harrowing adventure in the beast's forest. Afterwards, Mandalay tells them that there are hot springs they're allowed to go bathe in. Everyone perks up and, scrambles to go get changed. Izuku lingers behind. With his energy drained from his quirk usage coupled with his full belly, he's feeling quite exhausted. It's also been an incredibly long day when he's basically spent the past two weeks doing nothing but resting and recovering. He slowly starts gathering plates and bringing them to the kitchen, but Pixie Bob soon shoes him off, telling him to go, have fun with his friends. It's not that he doesn't want to, but it's the same problem he had in the morning. There's a certain amount of energy needed to engage with his classmates. Well, he supposes this is just another good excuse to hang out with Totoraki more. Not that he should ever need an excuse to hang out with him. When he reaches the boys' shared room, it's empty. They've probably all, gone to the hot springs by now. Thanks to the tour, though, Izuku already knows where it is, 
so at least he won't have to worry about finding his way. The hot springs did look kind of nice. Maybe a little soak will make him feel a bit better. He changes out of his uniform and puts it in his bag, wrapping a towel around his waist. Then, he turns and starts heading towards the door when something catches his eye. It's a mirror hanging on the wall. A small one, with little inspirational stickers and post-it notes around it, probably only meant to be used to check one's hair before leaving, but that's not what makes his Yuku pause. It's the sight of his scar. It's always his scar. He's. He's still not used to seeing it, especially not in passing. It always takes some mental preparation to look, at. In the bathroom, when he's undressing and getting ready to shower, he's always ready for it. He never purposefully looks too long in the mirror, but he's ready for the glimpses he'll catch of it. But ever since yesterday, when he decided to take off the bandages for good. Well. It's been difficult. Inko had gasped at first when he came home and did her best not to stare, but he could tell it, was hard for her to look at. His eyes lock on his reflection as his fingers reach up, brushing over the marred skin of his neck. Midraya? His Yuku jumps. Totoraki-kun. His heart leaps as he whirls around to face the boy standing in the doorway watching him with a curious expression. WH what are you doing here? He winces in pain as his throat twinges. Totoraki tilts his head slightly. You, didn't show up at the hot springs, so I came back to make sure you were okay. The statement makes his Yuku's intestines twist into a bundle of confusing, jittery knots. Of course he did. Because Totoraki's just that nice. And also completely naked except for the towel wrapped around his waist. His Yuku glances away desperately trying to force away the flush creeping up his neck. Totoraki steps, forward, eyes peering intently. Are you okay? Izuku nods rapidly. He opens his mouth to begin spouting some lie, but when he looks up, his gaze lands on Totoraki's scar. He falters. His mind flashes back to the sports festival, when Totoraki opened up to him about his past told him how his father abused him and his mother burned him, bared his soul to him when they hardly even knew each other, he thinks about how much trust Totoraki must have given him to tell him all that. It. It would be wrong not to do the same, wouldn't it? Besides, this is Totoraki. If anyone knows about scars, it's him. Swallowing heavily, he asks in a weak voice, do you ever get used to it? Totoraki stares at him. Izuku tries to give a wobbly smile and fails, then gestures to his throat. Understanding dawns on, the other boy's expression. He's quiet for a long moment. Yeah. Really? Izuku blinks in surprise. Totoraki nods. He steps closer so he's standing in front of Izuku and glances at their faces in the mirror. It takes a while, he says after a minute, and it's not easy at first. But soon it just becomes part of your body, I guess. And the memories. Become memories. You'll never forget about, it, and you won't get better quickly, but one day. You'll be able to look at your scar and. Be okay. Izuku's breath hitches as he stares at their reflections in the mirror. I hope so, he rasps, blinking away the sting in his eyes, I don't wanna. It it hurts to look at I know, Totoraki murmurs, I'm sorry. It's ugly it's not. Yes, it is. It's not. You were just saying that. No, I'm not. It's an ugly scar do you think mine is? The question takes him off guard. Huh? Do you think my scar is ugly? Totoraki asks. Izuku shakes his head. No, of course not. Then yours isn't either, Totoraki decides. Izuku purses his lips. Yours is different. He mumbles petulantly, lowering his eyes. Unfortunately, that brings his gaze back down to Totoraki's bare chest. Blood, rushes to his cheeks. Totoraki had to step pretty close into his personal space so that both their reflections could be seen in the small mirror. Izuku can still smell the faint scent of his cologne under the sweat he worked up in the forest. The rapid change in emotions from happy to angsty to flustered is dizzying. Izuku shakes his head as if to clear his thoughts. You alright? 
Totoraki asks, Yup, is Yuka rasps, taking a step back so he can breathe a little easier, let's just, uh, go to the hot springs. After a pause, he adds, and thanks. That. That really helped. Totoraki gives him a soft smile that nearly makes him drop dead right there and nods. No problem. Oblivious to the near cardiac arrest he almost sent his Yuku into, Totoraki turns and walks out the room, obviously, expecting the green up to follow. As his Yuku pads after him down the hallway, his mouth suddenly goes dry. Trailing a few feet behind Totoraki, is Yuku has the most wonderful view of the taller boy's well-muscled back. His wide shoulders seemingly go on for miles. Is Yuku's eyes roam over the taut muscles, following the hollow dip of his spine and oh, he didn't notice those back dimples earlier. Sitting right above Totoraki's butt. Wow. Now that's just unfair. Is Yuku is fucked, so very fucked. He's slightly less fucked when the universe decides to take pity on him by giving him an out in the form of throwing Koda off a high ledge so Izuku doesn't have to spend the next half hour making a fool of himself next to a half-naked Totoraki. Apparently, Mandalay put the boy on guard duty to, prevent the more lusty boys, whatever that means, from getting at the girls, but the poor five-year-old had accidentally gotten a peek at the girls and promptly fainted. It's unfortunate. But his Yuku is more than happy to take Koda to his aunt, all but fleeing from Totoraki and his chiseled ABS. He forgets about his dilemma entirely when he learns about Kota's parents and his apparent hatred for heroes, but it's inescapable when he returns to the shared bedroom when it's time to go to sleep. He's reminded of when Kaminari, Kirishima, and Kaken walked him to school when they wanted to use the pool. How Kaken picked up the rear while Kirishima and Kaminari went on either side of Izuku, keeping him in the safest spot. Ashido's words suddenly come to mind, I just wanna let you know that, we're gonna be super annoying and overprotective from now on. Okay. He understands. It makes sense, really. But this. This. This isn't good for his blood pressure. His futon is laid out smack dab in the middle of the room which is fine, of course, he expected that much. However, it's flanked by Totoraki and Bukigu's futons. Which just no. Izuku would very much actually like to sleep tonight. Thank you very much. Kaken is too noisy to sleep next to when Totoraki is around, and Izuku is too gay to sleep next to Totoraki. In addition to those two, Izuku's futon is also surrounded by, an order of closest proximity. Tokoyami, Kirishima, Ida, Shoji, Sero, Sayo, Ojiro, Shinsu, Aoyama, Kaminari, Koda. It makes sense, surrounding him with those who are arguably the strongest in the class. Those who would be most capable of protecting him, honestly, he can't imagine a safer place to sleep. The problem is that Izuku hasn't even sat down in his futon yet and Kakan and Totoraki are already arguing. Well. The former is arguing, the latter is kind of just ignoring him, thankfully. Looks like Totoraki much like Izuku is too tired to deal with Kaken's bullshit right now. Letting out an irritated huff, Izuku carefully picks his way, through the smattering of futons across the floor and plops down on his own. Oi, Zuka Kaken starts to say, but Izuku interrupts him. Kaken, I'm going to sleep now. Shut up. Kaken sputters and Izuku turns to the others, raising his voice as much as he can, which isn't much, and that goes for all of you. Lights out. Doctor's orders. You're not a doctor, Kaken grumbles under his breath, but Izuku silences him with a very irritated do not mess with me I am very tired and gay look. Fortunately for him, Ida, wonderful, unproblematic Ida hears his feeble voice and repeats his order much louder so that everyone else can hear. A few minutes later, everyone is in their futon and the lights go out. Izuku sinks back into his pillow with a sigh of relief. He considers turning, onto his right side, but that would mean facing Totoraki. What if he opened his eyes and Totoraki was facing him too, 